warm welcome, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> The technical department can get this straight. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for for sitting here to listen to me. Uh, thank you to Father Victor, who I know is serving the liturgy for a uh, blessing to come today, and I should take a blessing. Thank you to Metropolitan Jonah as well, who's been a great joy over many years to me. The t title of the talk I'm going to give today, I'm going to try and speak for about 20 minutes only, and then perhaps invite some questions. Uh, is the righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Further reflections on Colonel Philip Ludwell III. March the 14th or 27th on the church calendar this year will mark the 266th anniversary of the falling asleep in the Lord of Colonel Philip Ludwell III of Williamsburg, Virginia. And as many of, of you will know, and I'm prefacing a really a lot of what I say today with the assumption that many of you already know something about this story. Uh, Colonel Ludwell, when still a young man, uh, barely 22 years old by a few days, was actually received into the Orthodox Church at, at what was then a very small parish of the Russian Church in London, England at the end of December 1738. And last year, about uh, 15 months ago, I was invited to speak for a much longer time about Colonel Ludwell uh, at the St. Herman Youth Conference in Ottawa. And for a quick commercial, I have one or two copies of the recording here, if anybody's interested. And at the end of that talk, uh, one of the priests asked Metropolitan Hilarion, uh, could they have a blessing to begin to serve panikidas for Philip Ludwell on the anniversary of his memorial? And the, the blessing was given, and last year, as far as I know, at least eight panikidas were served in different parts of the Eastern American diocese. Actually, and also, I think, two in the OCA and one in the Ukrainian church that I've heard about so far. So, really what I want to talk to you about today is somebody who I think is, is a lot more than simply somebody who is seemingly completely out of the blue converted to orthodoxy. And since this blessing was given to have panikidas, things start to happen. Uh, which is exciting. So just after the Panikitas last year, uh, I was contacted by a lady from North Carolina uh, who turns out to be Philip Ludwell's older sister's great-great-granddaughter to 12 generations, uh, who was a Southern Baptist who had become a Roman Catholic uh, and was actually working with an Orthodox parish in Vladivostok, Siberia, and had decided to research her family history, only, find, only to find out via the internet, to her great surprise, uh, that one of her ancestors was a member of the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, so things happen when we pray. And Philip Little III was born in Virginia in 1716. He's actually, he's the third because his grandfather is the first, who's the first governor of North Carolina. Uh, his father is Philip Ludwell II, who's the first rector of the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, where I know some people here either are or have graduated from. And it's important to remember that at this, at this period in time, 1716, and indeed going back before the American Revolution, we're in a very different world to the world in which we live today. And that's something we have to do if we're to enter into history, is try to start to see things and to think as the people then would have thought and seen them, and not as we see it today. And that's very important, particularly when I say he was received, for example, he was received into the Russian Orthodox Church. Because, in fact, if you study the question, you'll find the expression Russian Orthodox Church, or indeed the expression Greek Orthodox Church, uh, barely feature in the English language until about 120 years ago, so around the end of the 19th century. And if you were to have found yourself in the Russian Church in London in 1738, uh, you would have found almost no Russians there. Uh, the entire congregation, as far as we can make out from the records, uh, were overwhelmingly Greeks, actually Alexandrian Greeks, uh, and also there were a number of English convert families, uh, including the wife of the priest, who had the nice name of Elizabeth Johnson, thereby demonstrating the Johnsons have been converting to orthodoxy for uh, nearly 300 years at least. <laughs> Uh, the priest himself, although I call him an Alexandrian Greek, was actually half French. So things uh, were very, very uh, 
cosmopolitan. And we're, we're, in a, we're in a time when the nation state, which is really a creation of the American War of Independence, the French Revolution, uh, the Greek War of Independence, doesn't exist. Uh, things are based upon kinship and family, uh, not upon ideologies of freedom and democracy or whatever else. And that's very important in terms of understanding uh, orthodoxy and the, and the Catholicity of the church. The, the priest who received Ludwell, uh, his name was Father Bartholomew Cassano, and as I said, he was married, but at some point, at which we're not quite clear, Elizabeth Johnson died, and again, somehow, and we don't know how, Father Bartholomew becomes a hieromonk. So he's, that's the, the parish in 1738 when Ludwell is received. And following, following Father Bartholomew's repose, which I think is 1746, uh, two Athenite monks come to London to serve the parish, and uh, persistently abused, spat upon, and treated very, very badly in the streets of London, and they leave very quickly. And they're followed uh, by a Russian pri the first actual Russian priest, uh, who falls ill almost immediately, probably with the British climate, and returns to Russia. And there then follows somebody called Father Stephen Ivanovsky. And this is the person I want to get us to. I am very, very indebted uh, to a very old Russian friend of mine in London called Misha Sani, uh, who has enormous energy, runs around the world fixing computers in his spare time, as well as doing historical research. And he was able to go to St. Petersburg in December this year and to, with a bit of hard work, find documents in the archives of the Holy Synod uh, concerning Philip Ludwell, which I was aware existed and had been given some idea of their contents, but never actually had the documents verbatim. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Now, as I said, Ludwell was received when he was barely 22 years old, at that point unmarried, at the end of 1738. He then returns to Virginia, it would seem around the beginning of February 1739. And this is one of the great mysteries. We then have more than 20 years uh, before he comes back to London. And when he comes back to London uh, towards the end of 1760, he brings with him three daughters, uh, his wife having already passed away at least 10 years before that, given the age of the daughters. And the priest, when he arrives back in London, is this new priest from Russia, Father Stephen Ivanovsky. And Father Stephen is a little bit taken back when this Virginian landowner uh, walks into his church. Uh, he's actually a member of the Gover Royal Governing Council of Virginia. He's a very eminent man. He's the largest landowner in the state of Virginia. And Ludwell has, has a number of questions for Father Stephen, uh, including, will you receive my daughters into the church? So Father Stephen writes to the Holy Synod in Russia in the, uh, at the beginning, in St. Petersburg, at the beginning of 1761. And I want to quote a chunk of that correspondence to you. Father Stephen writes to the Synod, in 1738, during the incumbency of the late hieromonk Bartholomew Cassano at this holy church, an English gentleman named Ludwell, born in the American lands and living there in the province of Virginia, came to London seeking the true faith, which he, with God's help, has swiftly found in the holy Greco-Russian church. And so, on the 31st of December of the same year, that's 1738, he was confirmed in the same with the Holy Chrism. The next year, 1739, he returned to his native land from whence he, having lived there for 20 years, came back to London last month of September and brought with him his three daughters, two of whom are 11 years of age and the third 20, who long time ago in America lost their mother minding to have them united with the Holy Eastern Church here, gaining through this union the one mother for them and for himself. So there's a very strong sense of you know, the church as our mother. And that's something I mentioned in the other talk in terms of the, the origins of how Ludwell converted, which I'll tell you about if you ask me a question later. <coughs> Ivanovsky goes on to explain in what's actually quite a long letter uh, that whilst he had been living in America, Ludwell had translated into English the Orthodox Confession, which is a catechism of Metropolitan Peter Megillah of Kiev. And he was now seeking a blessing from the Synod to publish and to distribute this catechism in English. And the quote is, the reason he wanted to do this was so that all the sons of the Holy Eastern Church dwelling in London without charge for their spiritual nourishment could receive edification. 
And Ivanovsky then continues, the same man, that is Ludwell, filled with orthodox piety, requested that I, unworthy, humbly petition the most ruling synod, so the most holy ruling synod, concerning the future condition of his soul. How should he conduct himself after returning to his homeland with his family? And let me stop there and say this clarifies something which was up to then in doubt. Did Ludwell come to London intending to stay in London? And clearly he did not. So how, so how should he conduct himself after returning to his homeland with his family, his homeland of Virginia? What shall he and them, and them do? Keep the practice of prayer only at their home, or would they be permitted to go temporarily to an English church, having no church of their own? so that they could offer their creator some due in public even thrice a year, thus drawing away from themselves the anger of local people, since there, and in the whole province of Virginia, and in the whole of America except nearby Pennsylvania, any other religion except the Protestant religion is forbidden. And let me just add, not only was it was forbidden, it was actually treason. Uh, for a member of the Royal Governing Council to not be a Protestant, and treason is a offence punishable by death. And to finish up with Ivanovsky's comments here, besides in his home country, still nobody knows about his change of religion since he is a counsellor in a high position in the King's service. And then we come to a really fascinating paragraph, something I, did, I never realised had happened since the days of the early church. Ivanovsky goes on, concerning the holy gifts, he humbly petitions the most ruling synod whether it would consider it possible to send them from here, that is London, uh, once a year some consecrated holy gifts, as was practiced by the early Christians, so that they, having been deprived of this spiritual nourishment after their departure from here, shall not fall into despair." since he had no greater concern throughout his 20 years there than the absence of these divine gifts, which he oftentimes longed to partake for the strengthening of his faith. And this, peti and this petition of the selfsame man, who is full of pious zeal, which is stemming from his great love for the Holy Church, I, unworthy, make bold to bring for the most holy ruling synod's compassionate consideration, and humbly beg for a decision that will bring him joy. So Ludwell is, has turned up in London and he's asking for quite a lot, really. He's asking for his daughters to be received into the church. He's asking for a blessing to do something he's already done, which is a good orthodox practice, uh, which is to, to translate and to publish a catechism. Uh, and, he's, and he's asking for advice on how to, how to maintain his orthodox faith when returning to America. Although, as I've already noted, he's already managed to do that for 20 years. And, and then finally, most radically of all, he's actually asking that the Holy Gifts, Holy Communion, uh, be brought to him in America once a year. Now, lest you think that would have been completely out of the question, on a good day, you could get from London to Williamsburg in just over two weeks. So it's not quite, a, on a bad day, three months, but in a good, on a good day, <laughs> in a good day, the right wind and so on, two, two weeks is, is within the bounds of possibility. So again, we're not quite as far removed uh, from, from the motherland as it was, as you might think. The other, the other thing, just to interject at this point, is it reminds me, Philip Ludwell reminds me very much of uh, a Russian elder who some of you probably know of, called uh, Staritz Tavrion. And Staritz Tavrion was uh, imprisoned by the communists, uh, I think in the early 1950s, if my memory serves me correctly, and was in, was in camps in Siberia and deprived of Holy Communion uh, for at least 20 years, after which he was released and returned to, I think, Estonia again, if my memory is correct. And I've met at least two people who knew Staritz Tavrion, both of whom say that he actually was virtually glowing with the uncreated light. And he was asked the question, how is, how is it that you've maintained your, not only maintained your faith, but grown in the spiritual life in the absence of Holy Communion? And Staritz Tavern replied, I was sustained by the word of God and by prayer. Which isn't to make an opposition between the two. Uh, but just to say, I think Philip Ludwell also is being attested as being a man filled with orthodox piety, uh, full of pious zeal, full of love for God. And to me that is really quite remarkable having only just converted to orthodoxy before he heads into the wilderness essentially uh, for more than 20 years. 
And again, surprisingly in this story, uh, again, I, I didn't write the exact dates down. I think the, the letter to the Synod is dated February of 1761. Uh, I don't know how long it would have taken the letter to get to St. Petersburg. Uh, but there, they have a reply by May, which even for modern Orthodox standards is pretty good going. <laughs> and um, in response to Ivanovsky's petition, uh, the Holy Synod very swiftly blessed the printing and the distribution of, cate of the catechism. And interestingly, the synods say the reason for this is to dispense it freely to those who would like to own it for their benefit. So whereas Ludwell is asking seemingly just for the benefit of the Orthodox community, the synod actually seems to see a wider, um, a wider use for the catechism. And I'm not going to quote, Ludwell writes a preface to the catechism, which is very beautiful and which very clearly has a missionary intent, which I mentioned in the other talk. And the synod responded... Uh, and I'm quoting now that he, priest Ivanovsky, having properly instructed and established the three daughters of the said gentleman Ludwell in the knowledge of our Orthodox faith, shall receive them into the Holy Eastern Church of their own volition through the appropriate church service. As to ways to preserve their Orthodox faith after their departure, what order of prayers to follow in their native land, and other matters related to the church mysteries, you, Priest Ivanovsky, shall, having diligently obtained from them the knowledge of all circumstances and customs observed there, and having carefully considered these, advise them with suitable caution. And then, finally, as regards the Holy Gifts, and the request to send the holy gifts every year to Virginia, uh, the synod reply, at the time of departure of the said Ludwell and his family to their native land, in consideration of their needs and circumstances as reported by you, priest Ivanovsky, and also his, Ludwell's, most fervent desire. If there is an unfailing hope in his perfect will to hold fast now and henceforth to our orthodox faith, and in view of the above needs, the Most Holy Synod gives you, Priest Stephen Ivanovsky, the blessing to provide him with the holy gifts for himself and for his children in a proper tabernacle, having given him appropriate instruction concerning their keeping. Now, previously when I had heard about this correspondence, I, I had I misunderstood that this blessing was given to Ludwell in 1738. And in fact, it's actually 1761. And so he never does return to Virginia because he has some sickness that's not yet clear what that is that leads to his uh, repose in 1767 and already by 1763 he seems to be seriously ill. And I'll use that as a, a change of tack to something else that's been gradually coming into focus since this talk in Ottawa 15 months ago and since the Panikidas last year, uh, which is the importance uh, as I said, I, would, I really want to put forth to you Philip Ludwell as a righteous, pious, zealous, holy man, uh, but also a man very much disposed to charity and to, and to exactly the things that Vladika Jonah was speaking about this morning, uh, which I mentioned in the Gospel for the Last Judgment today. And a lot of this crops up in the, in the context of something which I would never have imagined, namely his, his relationship and friendship with a man some of you may have heard of called Benjamin Franklin. And in December last year, I was able to spend some time in London, see my friend Misha, who I mentioned, uh, and we sort of did a little bit of a historical walk around uh, near Charing Cross Station, where a lot of these events took place. And in the afternoon before I met Misha, I went to uh, the Benjamin Franklin House in Craven Street in London. And as I'm sure you all know, the only house of Benjamin Franklin that's still standing is not in Philadelphia, it's in London. And... Um, it's ignorance is bliss, and so I, I, I got there, and it's December, it's miserable, it's cold, and tourists are you know, few and far between. And so I explained to the girl sitting at the desk in this house who I was and what my interests were and so forth, and told her that I'm sure she had something interesting in, in the house, in the papers in the house, and could I perhaps go upstairs and have a look? And she said, well, we don't really let people do that. And I said, well, I'm only here this afternoon. I've come all the way from America. Uh, and cutting a long story short, she went off and got somebody, and I found myself sitting in Benjamin Franklin's study. And uh, I found a letter there uh, from Benjamin Franklin to Philip Ludwell. Uh, Franklin had been living, I think, in London since around 1757, if I'm not mistaken, and was there till after the outbreak of the war here. Uh, but he briefly returns to, to Philadelphia in the mid-1760s, and this letter is written by uh, Franklin to Ludwell from Philadelphia in, in February of 1763. 
and it really attests to how, how strong their friendship was. Franklin writes, I must shortly make a journey to your country. And let me stop and explain your country is not England, it's Virginia. So I must shortly make a journey to your country, which I should undertake with much greater pleasure if I could promise myself the happiness of meeting there with my dear friend. But this is not to be expected, for I hear you are to continue this year in England. I pray sincerely that every blessing may attend you wherever you are, and particularly that of health. So this, again, is evidence that Ludwell is already sick. Oh, that I could invent something to restore and establish yours, your health. And of course, Franklin is the great early American inventor. But we shall meet, I trust, in a better country and with better constitutions, vigorous health and everlasting youth. And since it will be an additional pleasure so great in itself and so easily afforded us, I am persuaded that we shall know one another. Which I, I, I find very, very touching. Um, I'm still trying to figure out where Philip Ludwell lived in Craven Street because Franklin's house wasn't in the right place and when I talked to them they said all the numbers were renumbered about a hundred years later and only some of the original houses stand and I've yet to be able to go to, go to talk to the Royal Society of Architects and figure out whether one of the houses from that era that still stands actually was Ludwell's and whether we can get inside and see what's there. But from that letter of Franklin's, it's clear that Ludwell did not intend to remain in London, but rather return to his native Virginia. But God's will was otherwise, and he was to repose in London in, in, February, in March of 1767. And interestingly, it now seems to me very probable that Benjamin Franklin was at Philip Ludwell's funeral at the Russian church in London. Uh, Franklin kept a pretty copious uh, diaries and journals and so forth. Uh, but interestingly, this period is, is a black hole. Um, and the only document dating within the time of Ludwell's death and the funeral service and so forth is actually a letter where the, the date is rather blank and they're not actually sure it's even this year. But given the strength of their relationship, and I'll speak even more to that in a minute, I can't for a, a minute imagine why Franklin wouldn't have gone. Um, but of course, again, for similar reasons to Ludwell, that wouldn't have been something you would have been talking about publicly. Franklin and Ludwell worked together in a number of important educational and charitable initiatives in early America, starting in the 1750s. As some of you may know, Benjamin Franklin is credited with founding America's first hospital, the Philadelphia Hospital, and, sorry, the Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. And two years prior, to, which is 1751, that was established. Two years before that, uh, he began an educational establishment that was to grow into America's first full university, as opposed to college, which is the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, what is less known, and I came across in a newspaper article from a Philadelphia newspaper in 1755, is that Philip Ludwell III is actually the founding donor of both the Philadelphia Hospital and what becomes the University of Pennsylvania, uh, giving, I think it's 10 and, 10 and 20 pounds respectively, if I remember correctly, which doesn't sound very much, but actually translates to something like 30 and 50 thousand uh, dollars. Interesting, I also found towards the end of last year that Ludwell and uh, Franklin teamed up uh, in 1760 uh, with about 25 other gentlemen uh, to found an organization called the Associates of Dr. Bray. And this is also interesting to me because the person who's discovered all this, who's a, a professor in Williamsburg, uh, only again seems to have come across all this in the last three years. Uh, the purpose of the Associates of Dr. Bray uh, were, was to open schools to educate African American children. And the, so Ludwell is one of the founders of the first school to educate African American children in, in Williamsburg in 1760. So, as I said, he's a very, he's a very wealthy man, but he's also very, uh, very active in both works of mercy and of education. But I want to finish up coming back to his piety. His, his love for God is equally, is, is equally demonstrated along with his charity by his adherence to the Orthodox faith from his youth, which he retained, as I've said, for over 20 years, well cut off from, outside, from outward church life and then subsequently bringing his family into the faith. And again, I haven't, it's beyond the scope of what I'm going to say now. Arguably, some part of his family keeping in the faith to at least the 1960s. Uh, in those wilderness years, he's tra he translated not only the Catechism of Peter Mokila, uh, but I also have copies which I managed to get from 
with a lot of, from an archive in Texas, of his translations of the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil, or St. Basil, as you say, uh, the Great. And then one other very small document, uh, which I, 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 tr I really treasure, uh, which he wrote, which is, is called how to, how to Behave Before, In, and After Divine Services in the Church. And this is really just a two-page document, which is mostly just quotations from Scripture. Uh, but I, sp I think it really speaks to Ludwell's uh, reverence for God, uh, his sense of piety, and the importance of holiness. All of those things, I find something very lacking in our, in our contemporary church life. Um, and, and something we need to recapture if we're really to, to live an orthodox life and develop an orthodox mind. So to quote a few lines from that work, and these are the words of Philip Ludwell. As thou passest along to the church, present thyself before the king as the awful majesty before whom thou art going to contend thyself in the courts of his house. Enter the church with gravity and composure and present thyself before the sanctuary and devoutly adore thrice. Bless thyself with the sacred sign of the cross and say... Surely the Lord is in this place. How awful is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. How amiable is thy dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul hath a desire, a longing to enter the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh rejoice in the living God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So in conclusion... It's surely a remarkable thing that a man so connected to the early history of the American Republic, and I haven't even explained all the ways of his, 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 his wife is Martha Washington's cousin, he's the man who commissions George Washington uh, as an officer in the Virginia militia, he's a, a relative of Robert E. Lee, he's a relative of both Harrison presidents, uh, Thomas Jefferson is one of the executives of his estate and comes into the story later on uh, with the next generation of the Ludwell family and so on. So he's intimately connected with the early history of the, of the American Republic and yet at the same time he's a devout Orthodox Christian who faithfully and diligently strove to live and to witness to the Orthodox Orthodox faith, to love God and to care for the poor and the disadvantaged. And to that I can only respond, may his memory be eternal and may he be numbered among the blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chapman. Uh, he will be taking questions, but I think let's uh, sing We Thank Thee and get Sunday School started first, and then uh, Mr. Chapman will take questions. Uh, so let's stand up and sing We Thank Thee. Sunday school upstairs. The rest of you are welcome to stay and talk to Mr. Chapman. Give the microphone back to him. 
if, if you have any questions, if you can shout them out, and then I'll repeat them so everybody can hopefully hear. How did you uh, first, first come to discover yeah, the, the, the question is how did I how did I first uh, discover, if you like, Philip Ludwell? Uh, the short answer is I didn't. Somebody else did. Um, I was selling books, as uh, is my tendency, uh, at a, something called the Slavic Studies Conference in Philadelphia. Um, 2000, I think it was November of 2008, and a man who I, to this day, have no idea who he is and would love to find out, um, came up to me and said he had just heard a very interesting presentation about an early Virginian landowner who had become Orthodox, and he started to tell me, I, I could swear that this man said he was from Rokor and he taught history in Virginia. Um, anyway, um, we started to talk and then something else happened and that was it. So I was able to find out not the name of the man or anything else, but as I said, I don't know who, who this man was who told me this. Um, then about uh, the, the following, but I was curious, but I didn't know what to do with the information. Um, the following year, September, uh, I was in London, and I was uh, meeting with the Russian Archbishop there, and he said, uh, do you realize that you know, this parish is coming up on its 300th anniversary? And he gave me a, a newly written short history of the church uh, written by my friend Misha Sani, who I mentioned earlier. And Misha, in talking about the, because the Russian church starts in 1716 in London, uh, Misha mentions the fact that even starting in the 1720s, there are English converts. And he mentions even, there's a man from America. doesn't say his name. <laughs> um, uh, and it doesn't say when. Uh, but again, one of, one of these two, I forget, yeah, mentioned the thing about this commission from, from George Washington. Uh, sorry, this, the, this person also commissioned George Washington in the colonial militia. So thanks to our good friend Google, eventually I was able to find out that the person who did that was somebody called Philip Ludwell. And really sort of things gradually, uh, gradually got going from there. But uh, uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole thing is just it feels like... Um, it's, it's very strange. It feels that just so many things have happened that don't uh, feel to me very surprising and uh, actually connect to my own life personally as well, which, uh, I mean, to me, uh, to give you one of those, um, which is why I've become so, I guess, impassioned about this perhaps, and this is something I talk about more in the other talk, um, I didn't deal with the question at all of why did Philip Ludwell go to London and become Orthodox. Uh, he's, his family actually come from a part of Eng the southwest of England, at least most recently, so to speak, because I think they're German before that, uh, a, a place called Bruton in Somerset in the southwest of England. Uh, and I grew up in the southwest of England, not too far from Bruton. And um, there was a monastery in Bruton that began in the seventh century, and which uh, St. Theodore of Canterbury, who was a Syrian from Tarsus in Asia Minor, uh, gave to St. Alfred of Sherborne a girdle of the Mother of God that was kept in the monastery in Bruton. And when King Henry VIII came along, the monastery uh, was dissolved, as were most of the monasteries in Britain at that time, which is the 1530s. And the, the land of the Bruton Monastery and its church and so forth was given to the Ludwell Barclay family, including the girdle of the Mother of God. And part of that land includes the land in the town I was living in and the land on which stood the church in which I was received into Orthodoxy. Um, so that... You know, that's rather special to me. And, and strangely, and just jumping again, a slight tangent, but uh, this girdle of the Mother of God seems to have remained in what became the Anglican Church in Bruton in Somerset, which is a small town, very small town, uh, until about four years ago uh, when somebody broke into, the, somebody or bodies broke into the church and attempted to steal it, and it dissolved into dust. And it's about the same time as that that all this information starts appearing. Which may be a coincidence, but maybe isn't. The, the last time you were here, you, I talked to you briefly about um, your visit to Philip Ludwell's house in Williamsburg mm -hmm. and evidence of possibly a chapel. Could you talk about yeah. that? And also, based on what you just said, is there any connection with the Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg? Uh, well, so the, to take the, the second one first, yes. The, Bruton, the, the church in Williamsburg is called Bruton Parish Church because the early founders of Williamsburg essentially are the Ludwell Barclay family 
from Bruton. So yes, there's a direct connection. Um, the first time after all of this started happening, my, my wife and I went down to uh, Colonial Williamsburg. The first ever house purchased by Rockefeller for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation is called the Ludwell Paradise House, and it's in the centre. It's in the centre of Duke of Gloucester Street, in the middle of in the middle of uh, Williamsburg. But we learned when we went down that it's not actually open to the public. It's it's privately occupied by uh, employees of the foundation. Uh, but I tried to make contact with the foundation to find out if it was possible to go in while we were there and got put in touch with the chief archaeologist who said I would love to take you in there but I need time to get permission from the people who live there and so forth so perhaps next time you know you're coming down contact me you know, a month in advance and we can work something out uh, so that, that's what happened subsequently which was uh, December where are we now? To December 2011. And uh, the reason the, the, the archaeologist was interested to, to do that for me, as it transpired, uh, was two things. One was that he, he and his team had conducted archaeology on the house about six years ago, and there were several features of the house which was built in the early 1750s that they couldn't understand why the house had these features because no other house of that era has them. And so they were curious to see whether any kind of ecclesiastical use could explain them. And then as it turned out that this man also in, in Williamsburg uh, worked in Russia on the restoration of the New Jerusalem Monastery. <laughs> so uh, he was also particularly interested in orthodoxy. Um, so cutting long story short, he and I and a, a, a priest from the neighborhood, so to speak, an orthodox priest, uh, went in there and looked at the three particular features that, that they couldn't explain. And there was one of those features that we can't there's no, we can't say this for a certainty, but it's certainly intriguing. Uh, the house, like I think a lot, has that sort of symmetry, which is very typical of that period with the front door in the middle and a big room on the left, big room on the right, and two matching basements as well. And the only, given that this house is in the centre of Williamsburg and very close to Bruton Parish Church, the only part of the house which in any way would be private, of course, would be the basement. And in the east, on the, in the east side basement, on the east facing wall, uh, there's an apse. And that was what puzzled them because it undermines the structural integrity of the house. And they know that people building at that time would have understood it undermines the structural integrity of the house. Therefore, why on earth did they do it? And on the face of it, uh, it would seem to lend itself to some kind of worship space. Now, having said that, this is 1750s before Ludwell returns to London and nothing in Ivanovsky's correspondence indicates anything like that, although as I said we do see that Ludwell is asking for blessings for what he's already been doing. So when he's asking, you know, how should I be keeping the prayers and so forth, I think we have to assume he already was keeping some kind of order of prayer. And it was typical in those days for Virginia landowners, there were very few Anglican clergy in the colony uh, because there was no bishop there. It was very normal for plantation owners to lead Sunday worship in some kind of lay form. And Olga Sapiner, who's actually, I now know, the lady who gave this talk in Philadelphia, who's the librarian at the Huntington Library in California, uh, she, she believes that Ludwell almost certainly had some kind of extended household community, including slaves, uh, that would have participated, and she herself is not Orthodox, I should add, um, participated in some kind of Christian worship with him. But what if that's true, we, as I said, whether more, you know, whether more, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced there's still an awful lot more. I know at least there's already, for certain, one document in Texas in Russian that I'm hoping I'm going to get to find in, in August, and that may throw up some more, more interesting information. Um, I was thinking, so one other thought in relation to this just went in and out of my brain. No, I think it's, if it comes back, I'll say. Is, it, before it, is there another question before I come to Uh, I haven't. That, again, this is this is a huge question, uh, to which I have theories but not answers. Uh, the only the only I mean Ivanovsky's letter actually is now a second, if you like, mentioning simply his his desire to embrace the true faith. Uh, the the only document which is is published in in any way is there's a letter uh, from Count Simeon Volontsov, who's the Russian ambassador in London in the. 1790s, so you know, nearly 30 years after Ludwell's died, uh, but who is a friend of Ludwell's son-in-law, who's also Orthodox, called John Paradise, 
and Voronsov writes back to his brother in, in St. Petersburg in 1791 that there was this man called Ludwell who read the Church Fathers and became convinced that our faith was the true faith and asked to be received into the Church. Uh, interestingly, the, the Count Alexander Voronsov in, in St. Petersburg, who's receiving this letter in 1791, is the main supporter of the mission which takes place to Alaska three years later. Maybe a coincidence, but who knows. Um, there's another account I found of Ludwell's conversion which is wrong, beyond any doubt, uh, but still interesting. Uh, in, a, in a journal published in Scotland in 1898 about translations of Orthodox texts, uh, by somebody called Father Stephen Hathley, who's also a very interesting person for both early English and American Orthodoxy. Uh, he mentions there was this translation of the Catechism by this man called Ludwell, who we don't know anything about or words to that effect, but we think that he was somebody who fought with Bonnie Prince Charlie at the Battle of Culloden in, in, in 1746. Uh, they lost and he, along with many of the others, which is true, uh, fled to Russia, where he married a Russian woman, became Orthodox, and came, came, did this translation. Now, we know that Ludwell is very, very well documented as being here uh, in the 1750s. There's no way he's in Russia marrying an Orthodox woman, and also we know who his wife was here, and he had daughters by. So clearly none of that is, is accurate. But it does, it does throw up an interesting point, which I've also found... More recently, again, another letter from Ludwell's brother-in-law to somebody in Scotland, uh, which confirms beyond any doubt that the Ludwell family are what are called Jacobites, uh, who are supporters of the, the old monarchy of England, and the uh, church aspect, if you like, of Jacobitism is called the non-jura movement, and the non-jurors tried had a correspondence with the Orthodox patriarchs, and particularly Jerusalem and Russia, with a view to being received in the 17. Uh, late 1710s, 20s into orthodoxy. And actually, Father Bartholomew Cassano, who receives Ludwell, uh, was the secretary for all that correspondence with the non jurors. Uh, so there's de that's definitely somewhere in the frame. Uh, there's also some evidence that points to Philip Ludwell I, Philip Ludwell III's grandfather, uh, who's the first governor of North Carolina, coming. Well, he returns to London in the early about 1703. Um, there's some evidence to suggest he may have married a Greek woman uh, from Corfu, uh, and there's also therefore some kind of orthodox family lineage. John Paradise, who's Philip Ludwell's son-in-law, is at least a third generation English orthodox when he's born in 1741. And he... curious if there was any interest on in the part of Colonial Williamsburg in this story as far as doing further archaeology or or any kind of interpretation of that, that basement room, or are they kind of not, not particularly interested in it? Yeah, the, the question is whether the colonial Williamsburg people are interested in all of this. As I said, certainly the, the architect is and has been very helpful and actually after this visit uh, sent me information about two, two Russians he had discovered in Williamsburg in the 18th century. Um, uh, I haven't really followed that up in any way, but I... It's, I mean, I've, my, my, personal, my personal... One of my many dreams, and I'm a dreamer, um, would be that the Ludwell Paradise House could become some some kind of center for the study of orthodoxy in the Americas, given that they're not really using it properly. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful house, and it's kind of full of Ikea furniture. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, which doesn't grace the period uh, very well. And it's, it would be a very nice space and a great... And, and again, I, I, I have dreams of processions down... Uh, down Duke of Gloucester Street. As I said, a whole no I mean, one person who's become a very strong supporter who uh, is actually a, there's a society of people who can prove their lineal descendants of Thomas Jefferson, um, and he's also involved with Williamsburg. He's become a very uh, strong supporter of all this. Um, so I, I think at the moment, no, nothing is happening, but I, I wouldn't like to say it wouldn't, and I, and I rather hope it will. You said something earlier, I'm not sure I meant what you understand, about uh, not belonging to the Church of England being considered treasonous. Uh, yeah. And that America is known as a place of refuge for uh, sectarian religious minorities. I mean, he surely wasn't placing himself in, in any jeopardy by confessing. Yeah, the, the question is, I mentioned that, that Ludwell's being Orthodox was an act of treason, and given that America is a land of religious freedom, that couldn't be the case. Uh, well... The, that's not. It, it was the case, and America was anything but a land of religious freedom at that time. Um, 
it was the, ch the church, and, and it went from colony to colony, and the Church of England was the established church of, of Virginia, and the Bishop of London was the Bishop, Anglican Bishop of Virginia. And when there was a rev what's called the Glorious Revolution in England in 1688, when the Catholic monarch James II is replaced by the Protestant William of Orange, uh, there something something is passed called the Test Acts, and the Test you have to this is the whole basis of the non jurors they they abjure the oath of allegiance uh, to the new monarchy who they consider to be illegitimate, and you had to in order to be an office holder you had to both make the oath of allegiance and you had to receive communion in the Anglican Church at least once a year at least officially, um, in fact it seems that many ignored that and how much that actually got enforced. Uh, Ludwell's cousin became a Baptist and was thrown in jail for a while. She wasn't, ex but she wasn't an office holder. Um, but certainly there wasn't religious freedom as, as became later the case in the United States. This is not the United States. This is British America. <laughs> um, aside from the uh, example you previously mentioned, is there any connection historically between this person in Virginia and the rise of Orthodoxy in Alaska? or are they completely independent historical occurrences? It, the, the question is, is there any connection between these events in Virginia and what, and what later happens with the Russian mission to Alaska? That's a huge question. I, I, don't, I don't believe that there's any absolutely direct connection. Uh, the nearest direct connection is the one I've already mentioned, which is that Count Alexander Volonsov, who's the main secular backer of the the mission to Alaska knows about Lodwell's conversion, and actually also, I should add, um, attends the chrismation of his daughters, uh, because he's very briefly, much earlier, at a, only in, I think he's only like 22 years old, and he's already the, for like five months, he's, he's the Russian ambassador in London in, the, in, the, in 1762. And, and so there's, there's those connections, that, but you have to see a much sort of wider geopolitical situation. Uh, if you start, um, my wife and I had our honeymoon many years ago uh, in Alaska and uh, on a boat and there was a lady from the Oregon Historical Society on the boat and she very kindly, following meeting her on our honeymoon, sent me a three volume series of books about this wide um, called Russia's Conquest of Siberia and Alaska Documents in Translation. They're all primary documents translated from Russian uh, covering the whole period of Russian colonization of Siberia and Alaska. And if you start to read, read some of those, you'll see that at least from the 1720s, Russia and Britain are beginning to compete in the North, uh, in the North Atlantic, sorry, the North Pacific. Uh, and the part of the motivation from the point of view of the Russian state in the mission coming to Alaska, which of course is Russia, not America, uh, is, is precisely to extend, in fact, there's one, one of these documents says, it is in order because if we establish our church there, this will put it beyond any doubt that this is part of Russia and not potentially claimable by, by Britain. Now, again, the, the fact that the Synod so swiftly responds saying you can take the Holy Ghost to America is... So uh, how much, what, what exactly is going on here, I don't know. There's also a very another, another, another whole line of connection which uh, I, yeah, I haven't really had time to pursue, but uh, Philip Ludwell III's nephew is somebody called Philip Ludwell Lee, who's Robert E. Lee's great uncle. Um, and Philip Ludwell Lee is a business associate. He's also bouncing between Virginia and London. Uh, and Philip Ludwell Lee is a business associate of somebody called Dr. Andrew Turnbull. And Dr. Andrew Turnbull is the founder of the new Smyrna colony that the Greek church liked to advance in Florida as being the, the beginning of orthodoxy, if you like, um, in America. So all of these things are taking place. Um, there's actually a British Foreign Office minute of 1763 suggesting settling Greeks in the American South uh, and bringing priests with them because the Greeks have two advantages. They're not going to convert to Catholicism and the women are pretty. <laughs> uh, and so we'll probably intermarry and blend in so we can sort of like beef up the sort of anti-Catholic presence in the South by importing the Greeks who also know the kind of right, uh, right agriculture for that sort of climate as it were so all these, all these things are definitely interlinked I think in a general sense but whether, whether somebody actually knows somebody who says some, something etc I mean nothing's impossible anymore
Um, you mentioned that there were three structural abnormalities with the House mm -hmm. of Williamsburg, and you mentioned the apse being one of them. Mm -hmm. What were the other two? Did I yeah, yeah, the the other two, the one, the, the, uh, uh, the other, the other one that was intriguing vis-a-vis -vis potential orthodox uh, is in the between the kitchen and the dining room. There's a hole. There's a hole in the wall, uh, which apparently isn't normally found in these houses. And when I say a hole in the wall, maybe, um, yeah, uh, sort of roughly this kind of size. Um, and so, I mean, if you go to a Coptic church, you'll find them serving communion through a hole in the icon screen of that kind of size. But on the face of it, it's it's a very public space. We don't believe they were serving communion there. I think that's clear. So they 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 they, they wonder is it was it like a peak hole for the servants to see how far they'd got with their dinner perhaps, um, but that on the face of it doesn't doesn't seem to tie in. The the other the other feature if I'm I'm trying to remember it now for sure I think the other feature was the actual kitchen. And there's if you if you look at the Ludwell House when you're if you're in Williamsburg and you look from behind from the side you'll see what appears to be a sort of looks like an extension. Uh, to the, uh, would, it, that it wouldn't be part of the original property, uh, which is uh, adds you know a space maybe like from here to the wall over there, and the, and the house would be a similar length to here. Um, but in fact, they discovered that it does have a common foundation with the original house. But apparently, it's not normal to have this kind of extension space. But and which again would have potentially provided perhaps more private gathering space. But on the face of it, it's the it's the it's this app shape was just very very striking. It would be wonderful, of course, to chip it away and find a fresco. That would be even better. <laughs> yeah. you, you had mentioned um, Orthodox descendants of the family. Yeah. You talk about that, and also I have to say, you know, John, you were talking about it would be great if Colonial Williamsburg could have some serious study about this, which would, I think yeah. would be great. But it appears that his daughter, I don't know if it's maybe her name is Lucy, suffered from some mental illness mm -hmm. by the time she came back in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would love to see something serious because the only thing I see going to Williamsburg is talking about Looney Lucy and the haunted house and that yeah, kind yeah. of garbage. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as, as Father Stephen Ivanovsky's letter mentions, there are three daughters, although he suggests that the, the, the two of them are twins, because he says they're both 11, and I don't think that's actually quite correct, although they're pretty close together in age. Uh, Hannah, the oldest, marries William Lee and dies in Belgium in 1784 because Lee is a, a diplomat for the Continental Congress. Um, they, it doesn't appear that Hannah, after her father's repose, continues in orthodoxy as far as one can tell although she's buried with her father in the same church in East London and her great-grandfather. Uh, Frances, the, the middle daughter, uh, dies uh, just after her father, or even just before, I'm trying to remember. She dies at a very, very young age uh, and presumably dies in the church. Uh, the, the interesting one is Lucy, uh, who marries John Paradise, who, as I've mentioned already, is a third-generation English-Greek Orthodox um, by this point. Uh, they in turn have two daughters. Now Lucy is, is is of sound mind, albeit a very high spirited lady by all accounts, and and she writes. She returns to Williamsburg finally in 1805, and she's John and Lucy Paradise are very good friends with Thomas Jefferson, and she writes to Jefferson the day she lands in in Virginia. You know I am I am well thanks to God and the, and the prayers of my spiritual father the Reverend Yakov Smirnov. So we're we're certain she's continuing the faith, and John Paradise also beyond any doubt, who dies in 1795, I think. Uh, he's the godfather of somebody called the Earl of Guildford, who's the son of Lord North, who's the British Prime Minister during the Revolutionary War. And again, just this week in Russia, um, they found documents that prove beyond any doubt that Lord, that the, Duke, uh, the Earl of Guildford continues in orthodoxy throughout his life until his repose in the 1830s. Um, anyhow, going back to Lucy and John Paradise, they have two daughters, again, one of whom dies, I think, about the age of 14, and one called Lucy, again, they, these people are constantly using the same names, it drives you crazy. Um, Lucy, Lucy Ludwell Paradise Jr. Uh, elopes with a count uh, from Venice uh, called Count Antonio Barziza when she's a mere 16 years old. And uh, this was a great blessing 
to my research because Camp Buzziza has a very strange name, which is easy to track down. And uh, anyway, um, and again, this is another example of the providence of God. I really feel in all of this is I went, I went to Venice two years ago to see if I could find out what happened to Lucy in Camp Buzziza. There's a Greek, par the Greek church in Venice is the oldest Orthodox church in the so-called diaspora, uh, founded in 1498, and uh, serves mostly in Slavonic. And Italian um, these days. Anyhow, um, they didn't answer any of my you know, Father Kiprian, the Greek hierarch Jordan Jordanville, was faxing them in Greek saying, This guy's coming, can you help him? And in good Orthodox practice, nobody replies. Um, so I went anyway and um, went to church on Sunday morning. And I'm, there are two priests celebrating. There's two singers, one man, one woman. And I'm just trying to think, What do I do here? And praying and I thought okay I'm going to go and talk to the male cantor. The male cantor turns out to be a young Greek from Zimbabwe which was a British colony. He speaks perfect English um, and he also happens to be a researcher in the State Archives of Venice. Um, so he gets me in there the next day and, uh, and he, finds, he finds a document um, from a, a, a Venetian priest where he claims uh, to have converted Lucy Lodwell Paradise Jr. to Catholicism. Uh, prior to her marriage to Camp Barziza, um, which, but doesn't actually have the, the success, but that's what he says he did. Nevertheless, they have two sons, uh, the younger of whom is called Philip Ignatius Barziza, and he comes to uh, Williamsburg in 1815 to try and reclaim the family land, uh, which he fails spectacularly so to do, and becomes the caretaker of the asylum where his grandmother had died. Um, just a few months before he came uh, and Philip Ignatius has ten children uh, with his wife who's a French Canadian the daughter of um, a Canadian governor and uh, they have ten children which is very depressing when you're poor and uh, so he goes to have a drink when his wife is pregnant for the tenth time and says I don't know what to call this one and because this is definitely the tenth and the last and so the child is called Decimus Ultimus um, <laughs> And uh, D.U., D, D as he becomes known, um, has a book, there's, a book, there's a book about D.U. because he becomes a Confederate war hero in Texas, which is how we get to Texas and why all these documents are in Texas. And uh, I, spoke, I spoke, gosh, it must be two years ago now, to D.U.'s, D, I forget how many, great-great-grandson, I think it was. Um, although he's not really his great-great-grandson, he's actually the great-great-grandson of D.U.'s brother because D.U. didn't have any kids, but he adopted his brother's kids when they died. Anyhow, um, and this man who was in his early 80s said, I've never heard of Philip Ludwell, um, but I do, I, 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 do, he, I do know that my family was Orthodox from the time of Philip Ignatius. Uh, so... Uh, and, and, but his memory, this man's memory was going, he said, it's a real pity you didn't know my uncle Herndon, he was the keeper of the tradition. Uh, but he died in, as I found out subsequently, in 1997. Uh, but his uncle Herndon had all these, had the translations of the liturgies and the documents I'm quoting and everything else, which he donated to the uh, Texas World Fair in 1967, and they found their way from there ultimately into the Episcopalian archives in Austin, um, where they're very hard, and Again, it's a miracle that I'm the first person they've found these documents for and sent copies to because they've refused to do it for anybody else uh, so far, that I've, is my understanding. Um, and and, and Gatchut said to me that there was some big thing in Russian as well that Uncle Herndon had. And that he said, I think that's probably also in the same place. Um, and I have recently learned that um, when, the, when the three daughters were received in London, they were given a Slavonic gospel book as a gift. And I know also there's a, a, a wedding certificate of John Paradise and Lucy Ludwell. Um, there in the, if, you, if you want to read the Warren report about JFK's assassination, uh, you'll find some interesting things about Orthodox history, which also pertain to this story. Uh, you'll find out that Lee Harvey Oswald's child is baptized um, in the, the Rokor Parish. Uh, and, uh, and that Lee Harvey and wife are a friend of a a young man who ultimately becomes a, somebody called Archbishop Dimitri uh, in, in, in the OCA in Texas. Um, and you'll find out all of this in the testimony of a man whose name has gone out of my head, which is a very long, unpronounceable German name, um, who seems to be um, the CIA minder for Lee Harvey Oswald, 
and according to certain documents, he is a business associate. Um, he is a member of the, of the Rocor Parish uh, in Dallas, that's right, and uh, he's a business associate of a man called Barziza. <laughs> So uh, the, other, the other thing which we may come to light very soon, I'm hoping, um, in, New Orleans, in New Orleans, Louisiana, is the, um, the longest continually functioning Orthodox Church in the lower 48. And uh, that's First Liturgy is in 1865, I believe. Yes, 1865. And uh, there, are, again, I found record. The National Archives in London has a lot of records of the Russian Church, and there are records of people coming from the Galveston area for baptism to New Orleans. The Barzizas, I should explain, all moved. The whole Philip Ignatius' wife and all ten kids all relocated to Galveston, Houston area, in the 1850s. And um, the when the when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, uh, the Greek Church found itself six feet underwater. Um, which obviously wasn't very helpful, um, but it did mean that they realized that they had a lot of historical documents that nobody had paid any attention to for a very long time, although unfortunately they also got rather wet. <clears throat> and there was a lady there who was doing an amazing job trying to gather all this stuff together, catalog it, restore it, and so forth. They have Slavonic gospel books, all kinds of amazing things, again, going back to mostly from Venice, interestingly, from the early 1800s. Um, and their baptismal registers from the 1870s, um, 80s were, all, were very, very badly water damaged. And they've just found both a company and money to a company who claim that they can actually restore the information on the baptismal records. And so I'm just hoping that Cathy's going to be sending me an email anytime soon saying we found some Barzizas coming here to be baptized. Uh, because because Galveston, Texas, which is except the area, the, but again, this is another funny coincidence. The the, the, the Orthodox, this is a Serbian parish in Galveston, Texas, uh, where the first priest in the 1890s was the Tsar's uh, children's tutor, a Greek, a Greek working for the Russians, serving a, a Serbian community. And uh, but that the, the the oral tradition in that parish is that, that a prayer has started there in the 1860s. And so, again, is, it, is this coincidental that this is the same time as the Barziza clan are moving there? We, we can't say, but it's, it's intriguing co uh, an intriguing coincidence of dates at best. But if we can actually see a baptismal record from New Orleans um, with the right names on it, that will put it beyond any doubt. I think I've probably said enough, so I'd better give a commercial. Um, <laughs> All of this. I'm, I am working at the bookstore at Jordanville. I mentioned I gave this talk in Ottawa. There is one copy on CD of the talk. Uh, and there are, that's an MP, there's a collection of all the lectures, including mine, from the St. Herman Conference, one MP3, two CD sets. But if you're digitally inclined, if you go to Orthodox Christian Recorded Books website, you can download these talks at vastly less, less expense and yours truly will also receive 50 cents for every talk you download, which will help to pay for all these uh, archive fees and expeditions. Um, this is a book that we'll be publishing uh, at the monastery this fall, which is called A History of the London Russian Orthodox Synodal Church, A Microcosm of Orthodoxy in the West. And this has a lot... It, Ludwell and Paradise have a section in this book. I've been editing, this, editing the book for the last few months. And uh, it's going to be, I think, a, a real revelation to, to people in terms of just the continuity of orthodoxy in, in London and much wider area that interrelates, including America. Uh, we published a brand new book about St. Herman and the Alaskan mission recently with a lot of new documents from the Russian archives. There's another book that a, a man in London wrote called No Snow on Their Boots about the first Russian immigration to Britain, which is post-World War I but nevertheless talks about the origins of the London Parish and the Alexandrian connection. And last but not least, um, an introduction in the way into the Kingdom of Heaven by St. Innocent of Alaska, which is a wonderful, if you haven't read it, this is a new edition we've just done with study and reflection questions, making it particularly suitable for Lent. Um, I'm, if you don't buy all these from me now, I'm hoping that whoever's in charge of the kiosk here will be running over to buy them before I sell them to you, so she or he can sell them to you instead. But uh, I think that's the end of the commercial. Thank you. <laughs>